Hello, Minnesota. Welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. We have a very special show today. We're shooting live from Rochester, Minnesota. We're going to be here all weekend for the Republican Party State Convention. After this weekend, we are going to have newly endorsed candidates for the U.S. Senate, for the Minnesota Governor, for the State Attorney General, for the Secretary of State, and the state auditor. We ask you to join us this next hour. We're going to be talking to various leaders and legislators and activists and really getting a feel on the ground for what the 2014 elections are going to bring. Hello, this is Tony Hernandez. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. We are broadcasting live from Rochester, Minnesota for the Republican Party State Convention. And I'm here with candidate Lucas Check. And uh, Lucas, tell everybody what district you're running in and what geography it is. Uh, I'm running out of District 53A, and that is uh, western Woodbury, southern part of Oakdale, uh, southeastern Maplewood, and all of Landfall. And is this your first time running for office? And if it is, how's it going so far? This is my first time running for office. Um, I, I, I'm really excited about it. it, it I think it's going well. Um, but then again, I wouldn't know any differently. Are you uh, prepared to do the work that's going to be necessary these next six months till November? I am prepared and ready to do the work. Excited for it. Like I said, I've got a lot of friend support, family support. Um, I've had nothing but support within my district. Uh, and I've got a, a good, uh, good team behind me. So, Lucas, what are, what are the issues that you believe are most important facing the legislature? And what, what issues really get your passions going? Well, I've got a, a seven-year-old daughter, um, so anything dealing with education, obviously the education gap within our state is, uh, is a huge issue uh, facing us right now, and health care, not necessarily getting rid of what they passed and starting over, but, but finding something that's going to work well for everybody, um, and disability rights, uh, a stronger voice for people within the disability community. Can you tell, that sounds fantastic. If you could just let everybody know uh, what your website is and how they can help your campaign. Absolutely. Uh, my website is checkforhouse.com. That's C-Z-E-C-H-F-O-R-H-O-U-S-E.com. -E and that's uh, Lucas Check. Thank you, Lucas, for uh, the interview. And this is the Tony Hernandez Show live from Rochester, Minnesota. So we are here with young Republican activist Danny Ekstrand. Danny, you actually helped with the campaign in 2012, so I have to thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. What is it that makes you a Republican? Most young people are Democrats. Uh, well, I guess it's probably just the way I was brought up. I mean, my parents are both Republicans, but I'm not just one of those people that, you know, is like, my parents do this and I follow that way. Um, but I, I agree with the Republican Party and most of their stances. And I mean, I do differ from my parents, so I'm, I'm not just a follower. I do have my own opinions so with that respect. So uh, are and, and, and at your school, are you the odd duck, or there are a lot of other uh, young conservatives these days? Well, it is Stillwater, so it's a more of a red district, but I do find myself, you know, arguing the more conservative side in class when we have those types of debates. Uh -huh. And uh, why do you think uh, young people, generally speaking, are more liberal? Uh, I guess it's just the day and age with, you know, the gauge marriage amendments as well as those things. Uh, a lot of the younger kids are like, everything needs to be equal, whereas, you know, some in the real world, that's not how it is. And so they just, they not all of them want to come out and actually say what is actually happening. Well, I have to say that uh, we had our house fixed up uh, the other day, and I, I hired Danny to, to help with uh, some of the home improvements. And you truly work like a conservative. Are you still sore from all that pounding away that you were doing? A little bit more my my hands, but uh, you know it's pretty nice to uh, actually be able to go out and work. But the soreness subsided after a day or two. Yeah, hard work is uh, is a good thing. That's what I always say. So, do you have any favorites for uh, the U.S. Senate endorsement or the Minnesota governor endorsement? Uh, for Senate right now, it's between um, McFadden and Julian Julian Ortman. So, one of those two is where my vote will go, and then I'm pretty uh, sure I'm voting for Marty Seifert this next round. That sounds good, Danny. Well, uh, thank you for the interview. No problem. Hello, I'm here with Lisa Bellick, the president of MEPS. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So can you just tell uh, the viewing audience a little more about what MEPS is? 
Sure, MAPS um, is an acronym. It stands for Minnesota Excellence in Public Service Series, and it is a nine month long training, leadership training program for women. So we meet one Saturday a month for nine months. We take a three day trip to DC and do some networking on the federal level. And what we basically do is we expose the women to all the various different types of involvement that would get them more engaged in their government and their communities. And we, um, at that point, at the end of nine months, hope that we've exposed them to something that's going to energize them and motivate them to, to jump in and become more involved. So you're, you're the president of MAPS and you're also a graduate of the class of 2009. Uh, can you tell everyone about your experience going through the program and why is it important for uh, women to be part of a program like MAPS? Yeah, uh, the experience for myself as a, as a fellow in the program was, you know, immeasurable. Um, you meet once a month with these people who have the same same type of thinking for you, but different strengths, different abilities, different interests. And again, we were exposed to so many things. I learned, uh, I knew nothing about um, applying for state boards and commissions. And by the end of the class, I had applied to be on a state board. And I am now a chair of a s state board. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. And so do a lot of women who uh, become part of the MEPS program, a lot of them don't have political experience then? Um, yeah, I would say some are maybe involved in their party a little bit, but they're looking for how to take things to the next level. And I do think that women tend to um, look at their lives and say, oh, well, I'll get, I'll get more involved later when my kids are raised, when I'm at this point in my life. And they put it off. And we give them a lot of reasons not to put it off and, and to get involved now. I had uh, Representative Pam Ra Myra, who's Marty Seifert's uh, running mate on the show not too long ago. She's a graduate of the MEPS program, and there's actually quite a long list of successful MEPS graduates. Can you talk about some of them, there who they is. are? Yeah, we're very proud of, obviously, Pam Myra, Lieutenant Ga uh, Governor candidate. We have had seven women elected to the State House of Representatives. Um, uh, four are currently serving and, and rerunning. Um, we have four in our current class who are candidates for the House of Representatives this campaign season. We have three women who have been in, um, elected to city councils where they're from. We have a mayor of Woodbury is a graduate of our program. Uh, we've had women start uh, conservative talk radio shows up in Duluth. So yeah, we've got a varied um, array of success. That, that, sounds, uh, that sounds great. So if you're a, a, a woman out there and you're thinking about uh, getting involved, it sounds like MEPS would be a pretty wonderful and great place to start. Yeah, we um, accept applications um, through the second week of August and then we review all of the applications because we invite people statewide. Uh, we have face-to-face -face interviews with those that are selected to go through that process and then the class starts in September. It's the third Saturday of every month from September to June and then they graduate the following September. Can you just say that website one more time? Yes, mnexcellenceseries.com. Lisa, thank you very much. Thank Great you. seeing you. You too. So I'm here with Tea Party leader, and you've seen him on the Tony Hernandez show many times, Jake Duesenberg. We're here at Rochester, Minnesota. Jake, good to see you. Good to see you, Tony. How uh, do you think the convention's been going so far? Are you feeling good about 2014? Well, right now what we're doing is we're watching the uh, Senate endorsements. we got Chris Dahlberg on stage, and uh, this is actually what a lot of people get excited about. The positions so far that have been voted on are constitutional positions. They're kind of snooze fest for a lot of people. We did have two guys going for Secretary of State, um, and the first uh, guy conceded by the first ballot. So now it's the fun part of it, the Senate race, the, the sexy part of the uh, endorsing convention. Yeah. Well, well, there's a there's a lot of people uh, running Jake, and some people I've heard you know milling around that this endorsement could actually go well into the early morning, two three in the morning. Do you think that that's going to happen today? I hope not. I didn't bring my sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have no good read on where the people are on the Senate race. Um, I know there's a lot of undecided people. Um, there's a lot of money in this race. Julian Ortman's uh, raised about a million bucks. Mike uh, McFenn spent millions of dollars already. So it's interesting. It could go quite a long time. You know, one of the things that uh, they announced, uh, Rich Stanek announced, was the people who are going to honor the endorsement and the people who aren't. I think State Senator Julian Ortman, she's going to honor the endorsement. Chris Dahlberg, honor the endorsement. 
endorsement. Mike McFadden, he said he would not. Jim Abler, he said that he would not. Monty Moreno said that he would. Uh, in your opinion, uh, is the endorsement process changing, and, and does it influence who you're going to support, whether or not they say they're going to honor the endorsement? Yeah, it absolutely does, because if you're going and putting your message in front of the delegate pool, you're asking for their endorsement. I think you should abide by the endorsement and get behind that and rally behind that candidate. Now, it's a different thing if you just decide to bypass endorsement and just go straight to primary, you're not wasting our time that way. But the people that are wasting our time and have no intention of abiding by the endorsement, I think that's wrong, and I wouldn't vote for someone that does, doesn't want to abide by the endorsement here. So, Jake, I need to hear your prediction. Uh, who's going to win the U.S. Senate endorsement, and who's going to win the governor's endorsement? I actually I can't even give you a good prediction on that. Uh, I would think that tomorrow you'll see, uh, in, uh, in the Senate race, I don't know, the gubernatorial race, I think it'll be ciphered. Uh, Dave Thompson or Jeff Johnson, one of those three individuals, uh, will win the endorsement. And is the Tea Party, does your Tea Party group, you, you guys choose not to endorse. Uh, why is that? Well, we think it makes people lazy. If we endorse, then they don't have to vet themselves. Who's going to make the idea at the Tea Party? Ten people and a, and a panel? That's wrong. The Tea Party is so vast, it's a huge movement. So we want to provide you with information you need to know, and then you make that decision. That's our philosophy. Well, Jake, I think uh, your parents are about to get here, so uh, thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Tony. Appreciate it. Yeah, have a good convention. Yep. All right, so we're at the first day of the Minnesota Republican Convention. The U.S. Senate nominations are almost over, and the delegates will be voting soon. Uh, there's around 2,000 delegates that uh, are going to be casting their vote. By everyone's count, it's going to be a pretty close race, and the two top contenders being Mike McFadden and uh, the person who's behind me, State Senator Julianne Ortman. So we're all kind of on pins and needles right now. Uh, we're going to hear the results from the first ballot here probably in about an hour as it takes them some time to count them up. But we'll keep everyone updated in terms of the numbers, if we have an endorsement after the first ballot, or if it's going to be, like many people are predicting, uh, that this endorsement race can go well throughout the night. So uh, stay with us. I'm here with Melissa Hackenmuller. She is the Solutions and Outreach Coordinator for the Republican Party of Minnesota. And uh, Melissa, it's good to have you here. Fantastic to be here. Are you having a good convention so far? Absolutely. Very exciting. So one thing I wanted to talk to you about, because you're in charge of uh, reaching out to new communities and diverse communities, which is something the Republican Party has needed to do for quite some time. And it looks like a lot of success has happened. Uh, you look at Doc Severson's campaign, and he had uh, a very diverse, multicultural constituency. Can you talk about some of the outreach that you're doing at the party? Yes, well, we're very excited. We're making some great inroads. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, it's not just Doc Severson who's had um, minority and other you know, new immigrants in his campaign. It's a few of the other candidates as well. That's true. We just saw State Senator Julianne Ortman. Uh, she had uh, somebody speaking Somali to the delegation. Right, right. And it's exciting because the work that we have started doing at the party, it seems to be picking up among the candidates as well. And uh, so what other activities? Are, are you guys going out to community events? And talk about what that's... Absolutely. Um, we're very excited because we have been going to different um, cultural fairs. So, for instance, Cinco de Mayo, we had a GOP booth there for the first time in West St. Paul. Um, we're going to be at a, um, an Asian market in St. Paul, first time, and um, things like that. Yeah, so how do we explain to diverse communities, to multicultural communities, that the Republican Party has the solutions, that conservative solutions are good for them and for their families and children? You know, the fantastic thing is we really share the same values. Family values, economic values, at the core, our values are the same. And it's just that, unfortunately, the message has, you know, we haven't been reaching out to them in the past, but we want to change that, and we are right now. That sounds good, Melissa. Well, I'm glad you're working on that, and uh, it was a great seeing you. Great, thank you. Yep, thank you. So I'm here with Minnesota State House Minority Leader, Kurt Dowd. Kurt, glad to have you here. Thank you. Glad so, to be with you. Uh, how's the convention going for you so far? Well, you know, it's good. It's interesting. It's uh, there's it's 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 uh, there's an energy on the floor, and the and the delegates seem kind of excited about our, our opportunities and our prospects uh, this cycle. So it's it's kind of fun. Yeah, 2012 was kind of a rough year for conservatives and, and Republicans. Uh, 
What are what's different about 2014 that's going to bring about different results? Well, I think uh, you know it's interesting, and in, in, in just in Minnesota here, uh, we often see a different kind of election cycle from a presidential election to a non-presidential. Uh, you've got uh, you know this year obviously the second term, midterm of an incumbent president usually is unfavorable to that party. Uh, but I think more than anything, uh, what we've seen for the first time in a generation is what two years of single party control with Democrats running all of state government can do for Minnesota. And, and frankly, Democrats have put Minnesotans and their family budgets on the back burner uh, while they have raised more taxes and increased spending at a rate that we haven't seen in a generation. So uh, I think we're going to have a great opportunity to get our message out about uh, fiscal responsibility, but really uh, bringing prosperity to Minnesota family budgets and, and, and really putting Minnesota families first. And uh, so how many seats need to be won by the party in order to regain the majority in the state house? And then also, can you talk about specific great candidates that are up and coming and races that you believe are winnable? Sure. You know, we've got, uh, we have to win seven seats to win the majority back. Only seven seats out of 134. Uh, to put that into perspective, in, in 2010, we lost, uh, excuse me, in 2010, we won 25 seats. In 2012, we lost 11 seats. So seven is a very small number. Um, but really what we want to do is win something in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, 12, 15, 18 seats and, and really put a stake in the ground on a permanent sustainable majority for Republicans in the Minnesota House. Um, and, and, and when you look geographically at the state of Minnesota, um, there are seats all over that really uh, should be Republican seats. There are nine seats that Romney won in uh, 2012 uh, that Democrats currently hold uh, in the Minnesota House. And, and uh, we're gonna, but we're going to take our message really to every district all around the state, um, from from you know inner city Minneapolis and St. Paul to the Iron Range to to uh, the suburbs and and greater Minnesota and everywhere in between. So um, we're going to bring our message everywhere, and we believe that our message is going to resonate, especially in this environment. Well, Kurt, thank you for your time, and have a great convention. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Tony Hernandez. We're live from the Minnesota Republican Party State Convention. I am here with newly endorsed candidate Randy Gilbert, who's running for the state auditor. Randy, congratulations on your endorsement. Hey, thanks, Tony. Thank you so much. It was pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh, to see you had a unanimous endorsement. That's got to feel pretty good, doesn't it? Well, it is good. You know, and, and it goes back to the fact that we've been working so hard for quite some time. Being the only candidate was was an award in of itself to know that people looked and thought, we've got a good candidate, there's no reason to oppose him. So I feel really good about what my team and everybody has done over the last year to make, to make this day happen. And what sort of uh, messages are you hearing from the delegates here about the state auditor position? Are they re ready to retire Rebecca Otto? Well, you know, we've been using more of the word fire and we brought this up in the speech a little bit Rebecca Otto has you know tainted her into independence which is the cornerstone of auditing and in the real world if your independence is tainted you get fired and the, the delegations with me that's time to fire Otto and I'm gonna be the guy that they can uh, replace her with you know one issue that I heard from a lot of the folks uh, from the Iron Range district was about uh, mining can you tell us a little bit about what Rebecca Otto's record is on mining sure absolutely you know as a state auditor by law you're a member of the executive council which votes for the leases for a lot of things but mainly lease uh, for mining and last fall when this came to vote Otto voted no against mining and she, and she just said, you know, I'm not for mining, and then immediately fundraised on it. And she has been doubling down and tripling down on the fact that she is not for mining in the range. She thinks it's unsafe. She's uncertain if, you know, what's going to happen with it. And the eighth is not happy with her because if anybody in the world knows how to mine, it's our friends up in north, northeast Minnesota. They want the jobs. They know they can mine safely, and she's saying no to that. And, in fact, I'll go out so far as saying I think if Rebecca had her way, she'd make the eighth a whole uh, national park. And the only thing that you could do up there is work in a bed and breakfast, and they are not happy about that. Randy Gilbert for State Auditor. Tell everybody what's next for the campaign and how do they get a hold of you? Sure, it's 156 days of traveling the state. We're going to be, you know, hitting spots up, you know, north, south, east, and west. We will spend a lot of time up in the 8th District because it's an important message for them. But, you know, the big thing is to educate the people about this position, get them to know who I am. And if they want to get involved, please go to gilbertforauditor.com. You can contact us. You can read a little bit more about my credentials. And if you have some questions get a hold of me and, and we'll, we'll help you out. Randy Gilbert thank you so much. Thanks Tony.
That's Gilbert for Auditor.com, and it's Randy Gilbert running for State Auditor, recently endorsed by the Republican Party of Minnesota. I'm Tony Hernandez. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. Thank Welcome, you. everyone. I am here with State Senator David Senjim, live from Rochester, Minnesota, at the Republican State Convention. Randy Gilbert for State Auditor was uh, just endorsed. Uh, Senator, it's good to have you here. This is your home district, isn't it? It's good to be here. This is, uh, yeah, this is my district and my town. It's a lot of other people's towns as well. But uh, we're proud of Rochester. We're especially proud today because we've got a great Republican convention going on. Well, you've had a, a long, successful tenure in the state Senate, and I'd imagine this isn't your first convention you've ever attended. No, but I, you know, honestly, not not so many. Maybe four or five. It, uh, you know, it's within reason, so to speak. Uh, I don't always come to these things, but this is especially uh, gratifying and, and I think wonderful for us because we're able to be the hosts. Yeah, and, and all these people come to Rochester. Tell us what a beautiful city we have kind of makes you feel fun you know uh, feel good about that it's well, I, I love I love Rochester and my father went to the the Mayo uh, Medical School and I grew up here for the first six years and you actually knew me when I was a, a little one two years old uh, can, you, do you, can you share any memories you might have of that well not of knowing you at two years old but uh, but uh, to some extent sure yeah I, uh, I knew your mother very well at uh, the Northern uh, Children's Onco Oncology uh, Services house I was I was a board member, I was chair, I watched you grow up, I watched your mother uh, have a lot of children in that house, and <laughs> it was all fun. So what do you think about the energy here, what, and, and what are our prospects for uh, November? Are Republicans going to win the majority in the state house? Are we going to see a new governor? Yeah, I, I just think uh, there, there's a lot of energy in this building right now, and there's a lot of energy throughout our party, and, and I think, you know, there are moments in time, and I think this year is our moment in time. The winds are blowing this way, not only out of St. Paul, but certainly out of Washington. And uh, we're going to ride those winds. There's a lot of enthusiasm here, a lot of competition, obviously, for the United States Senate, for the governor's office. But whoever, whoever comes out of that, I think we're all going to coalesce behind. We understand the stakes. We understand how important it is. We've got to move Minnesota forward with a different agenda. And I think uh, it's going to start here today uh, as we endorse uh, our United States Senate candidate and certainly tomorrow with a governor's candidate. You know, one of the promises that Governor Dayton made uh, when he was campaigning was that he wasn't going to sign into law any bill that didn't have strong bipartisan support. Has the governor uh, lived up to this promise? No, he's not at all lived up to that uh, promise at all. I mean, uh, invariably, many, many of the major bills uh, were certainly uh, single, single party bills, so to speak, from the standpoint of coming out of the Senate and the House. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is the most partisan two years that I've ever been a part of. There's no question about this. Uh, you would think maybe they'd try to bring at least the bodies together to get some degree of cooperation on some of these bills, but, but not at all. We were uh, basically, if you will, stuffed for two years. And, and so that's not pleasant. That's not fun. And that gives us energy, by the way. Senator Dave Sanjim, thank you for uh, coming good. on. Thank, thank you so you. much. Oh, it's good to see you. Uh, say hi to your mom. I will. I will. <laughs> will do. Okay, I'm here with Representative Steve Dreskowski. Steve, thank you for uh, agreeing for the interview. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me. So your uh, truck, just to let everyone know, just reached uh, a pretty incredible milestone. Can you tell everybody about that? Well, I'm up over uh, 423,000 miles on the truck. Now, I just put two new uh, wheel bearings on the front, and, um, you know, I think they'll be good for the rest of the life of the truck. Uh, I have to ask, what, what kind of a truck is it, and how do you make a truck ride for 423,000 miles? Well, it's it's a Dodge Ram. It's a 1999. I bought it brand new, uh, so I've owned it for 15 years. And I think it's by taking care of it. I've changed every oil change myself and replaced, uh, you know, alternators and batteries and other things uh, myself. And I just keep it in good shape and uh, and use it a lot. So I talked to uh, Minority Leader Kurt Doubt earlier, and we talked about the last session. Do you have any thoughts about uh, the last session, how it went? You know, I, I, it was really a Katie bar the door. The Democrats uh, basically had their way uh, with their agenda, was, is what I think we knew going into it. Um, I think we were able to stave off a few things from negotiating and so forth, but the uh, unbridled liberal agenda that was brought forward, uh, the level of union payback uh, that we saw, the number of, of union building bills where um, public money is extracted and, and brought into the hands of, of union bosses to then be used to elect Democrats was even more enabled in a variety of bills. Uh, that's one of the things I saw. Of course, growing government by uh, you know 12% increase 
increase in all funds spending over the biennium, uh, the largest spending increase in the history of our state, bringing gay marriage and the radical uh, liberal agenda forward and also embodied, of course, in the bullying bill that we saw, the same people that brought us gay marriage also brought uh, elements or uh, of, of that uh, into uh, that agenda into our schools. So. Um, a variety of things. I think uh, Minnesotans should be alarmed about where this um, unbridled majority has taken us, and they should realize they need to put Republicans back in power in the House and the governor's mansion so we can bring some semblance of order back to the direction that state government has taken here in the state. So, yeah, one of the reasons why we're here is tomorrow we'll be endorsing the Republican governor to run against uh, Governor Dayton. There's some rumors still swirling out there, I hear, that uh, Mark Dayton may not be actually running that he's going to drop his name out but so what do you think the chances are for the Republican endorsed candidate for governor to defeat Mark Dayton? I think they're very good. I think they're good if we can have a candidate that clearly articulates the conservative message. Um, Minnesota is a conservative state uh, even though uh, the Democrats do very well here, we have a large number of Democrats and independents that are conservative-minded people, even though uh, some of them vote Democrat often, um, and some of them, of course, swing back and forth between Democrat and Republican. If a strong conservative message, one that empowers people and freedom over a vastly growing government that limits people's freedom, I think if that can be done uh, and we have the right person carrying that message and carrying it effectively and consistently, I think uh, we can recapture the governor's mansion. Now, Chris Fields, you were just elected deputy chair of the Republican Party. Congratulations. Uh, thanks, Tony. It was a great honor that was given to me by the uh, delegates, and uh, now we're ready to go to work. What uh, are your thoughts of the convention so far? Is there a lot of energy here? Oh, yeah. I think these guys are real fired up. I think they want to endorse somebody. I think all the candidates are top-notch from top to bottom. Uh, there, we have no sleepers. These guys are rock stars. So you've been uh, part of the party leadership now for a year, and I, since Keith Downey has taken over as, as chair, I've noticed a lot of great improvements to the party. Can you talk about some of the things that you've been doing? Sure. So we've done a tremendous effort to identify voters and to really connect with all voters, especially independents. Um, we have uh, healed our wounds from 2012. It was a pretty tough year. Uh, we've done a lot with regard to raising money, so I'll give you a couple of ideas. Um, last year we had 200 people on our annual fundraiser. This year we had 700. And so there's a certain excitement back. We've added thousands of small dollar donors uh, to our party uh, donor rolls. And that's just an idea of the fact that people are excited about a party again. We were talking to Melissa Hackemuller, who uh, works for the party, she's a staff, and also Andrew Ojeda. Uh, we were talking, we, you know, just looking around, you see that the Republican Party is getting more multicultural, more diverse. What sort of initiatives have uh, leadership taken to reach out and make the tent bigger? So I think what we've done is started to actually uh, identify talent. I think that when I ran in 2012, I think we were still struggling and we weren't identifying these young people. Uh, Melissa is a great young person, a lot of energy, uh, so is Andrew. And these guys are really the best at what they're doing right now. And so the fact that our party is able to identify uh, this young, fresh talent means that uh, we're going to have a sustainable majority uh, when we do win. So this year has been a, a bit unique in terms of there's a number of governor's candidates running for the endorsement that have said that they're going to keep going into the primary. There's some U.S. Senate candidates that are vying for the endorsement, but, but they said that they're going to keep going to the primary. Is this healthy for the party? I think that uh, what's going to be clear is this. We are going to stand behind and support our endorsed candidate, okay? And the folks that are going out to the primary, you know, okay, we get it. Um, that's their constitutional right. And we're not going to be afraid of someone who exercises their constitutional rights, okay? We're just going to stand up behind our endorsed candidate. And all of these delegates are ready to drop the lit. They're ready to do the volunteer calls and do all the things that it takes to make their endorsement count. And so uh, I think it's going to be healthy in the end. So you're not running in, in 2014, but I did see that you hosted a, a luncheon. Uh, for Shana Walgren and then uh, the gentleman who's running Doug in the fifth, yeah. Doug Daggett. And uh, do you have any words of advice for Doug in, in terms of how is he going to uh, take on Ellison? Sure. Uh, and this is just with the Democrats in general. You have to stay on offense with these guys. You know, uh, you've been there. And that is only to say this. 
we have to uh, ensure that the truth about their record is being told. I think oftentimes we've spent too much time trying to defend ourselves and our policies, and we haven't really highlighted what their policies have done. They are responsible for the achievement gap. They are responsible for an economy that just can't get out of gear. And so people need to understand that. And when they do, uh, we end up the winners after they look at our policies. So we've had uh, endorsed so far as Doc Severson, uh, he running for the Secretary of State, Randy Gilbert, the Auditor, uh, the Attorney General. Is, um, yep, those are the two we had so far. And then do you have any predictions for U.S. Senate or Absolutely government? Absolutely not. I can't. These guys are that good. I mean, I don't know. I'm excited to see the first ballot when it comes in. Chris Fields, Deputy Chair of the Republican Party, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Tony. I appreciate it. They just announced the first ballot for the U.S. Senate, and it looks like we're going to be going to a second ballot, so we'll keep you updated with that. But I wanted to introduce you to Michelle McDonald. She's running for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Michelle, very nice to meet you. Uh, my father is her physician and when I was a kid I think I swam in your swimming pool and got my first earache that way. So. <laughs> yeah, Timothy uh, Hernandez. So tell everybody why you decided to run for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Well, um, I'm running against Justice Lily Hogg and um, my I've always aspired to be a United States Supreme Court Justice. Um, I believe in pro-life. Um, and uh, that, that just I've been a, an attorney for 27 years. Wow. Um, where did you Where did you go to law school? I went to law school in Boston at Suffolk University, nice. law school. And uh, could you just tell everybody a little more about your family and where you grew up? Okay. Uh, grew up in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I have a large family, probably about as large as yours. Nice. Um, how many? How many brothers and sisters? Eight brothers and sisters. You have seven. Uh, yeah, I'm the oldest of seven. Okay, oldest of seven. I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. Yep. I'm the oldest of eight. That means you're you're very wise then, and perfect for uh, the We're, judiciary. Yes, very wise, very wise. And then uh, now my parents, uh, Charles and Irene Lowney, uh, have 28 uh, grandchildren. So. Uh, so. One of the uh, one of the issues that comes up is, uh, you know, some people are for voting for the Supreme Court justices, and some mm. people are against it. Mm. Do you have an opinion on how uh, justices are selected? Well, here's what's happening. Okay, we have a constitutional right to vote for all of our um, state representatives, including judges, and I'm becoming uh, painfully aware that what has happened over the course of many many years is we have um, you go into you go, uh, we we don't uh, ha have judges running anymore um, I understood it was a dual system of appointment by a governor or running but it isn't a dual system what has happened is that uh, when when an, va an office is vacant uh, it allows the governor to appoint um, any type of um, so that would happen in the case where a uh, justice retired or got ill well or here's what's happening it happened in the case of Paul Wellstone because he died okay it's it doesn't happen in other uh, in any of the people here they don't just um, decide to uh, step down um, retire just before election so that the governor can appoint it only happens with judges. That's why when you go in um, to vote, you see uh, all of the judges, and most of them, all of them are listed as incumbents all over the state. And you just say, well, what's that? Oh, they're just the incumbent. It is, uh, it is a, a, a erosion of our, our right to vote, really, our right to vote for judges. These are important positions. Judges affect our lives. They're the highest authority in the land from a small claims court judge, which I have been for 15 years up until this year, because I'm running for um, state Supreme Court judge, to the United States Supreme Court. So can you just tell everybody how they would be able to uh, find out about your campaign? Well, uh, I um, have a website called mcdonaldforjustice.com. That's a M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. Thank you. And um, they can just call me. Uh, um, I'm very available. Um, so. 
How many other judges are going to be running in uh, this year? None that I know of. So it's just you? Just me. You, you have to choose who you're running against. And I'm running against David Lillyhog, who is the, uh, a Democratic appointed judge. He never ran. Uh, judges don't run because what happens is when, I'm telling you, when a judge wants to retire, they work something out with the governor, decide to retire or step down, and the governor gets an, an open position that's appointment. Uh, so we don't um, uh, have a lot of judges running. Well, I encourage everybody watching to learn more about Michelle McDonald running for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And Michelle, good seeing you. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Say hello to your dad for me. I will. I will. Thank you. The results of the first ballot were just read, and I'll relay that to you. Chris Dahlberg had 497 votes with 25%. Uh, Jim Abler had 133 votes, 6.7 percent. Uh, Parrish had 323 votes, surprising a lot of people, with 16 percent. Mike McFadden had 458 with 23 percent. Monty Moreno, 112 votes, 5.6 percent. And State Senator Juliana Ortman, 447 votes, 22 percent of the vote. We could be here a while. Uh, that's why I'm glad I'm here with the Republican Party of Minnesota National Committee woman, Janet Beinhofer. Janet, good to see you. Tony, good to see you. So what's your prediction? Are we going to see an endorsement today? I honestly don't know, and I'm not so sure. I thought we were going to get an endorsement coming in. I thought this one might just go to primary. Regardless of what happened on this first ballot. So how would how would the decision be made if we're at two or three in the morning and we still don't have an endorsement? Does somebody have the authority to suspend the convention? Someone would most likely have to make a move to suspend the convention. But with the Palenti race in six to two went to two AM. And he finally got endorsed. And he finally got endorsed. How many, how many ballots did it go to? I don't know how many it went to. I think it went over 20 ballots. But there's two levels. You have to get 60% of the votes here, but you also have to get 60% of the original number. So if too many people leave, then you, can, you cannot make it anyway. It's like if half the delegates decide to up and go, they're tired, we by default go to a primary. Oh, wow. As far as, far as I know. I, I didn't, uh, I was unaware about that, but you know, one thing that's for sure, Janet, we've talked to various leaders of the party, uh, there is a renewed energy for the Republican Party in Minnesota in 2014. Uh, it seems like people are ready to get out there, work hard, mm -hmm. and win. What, and we have a lot of great candidates for the U.S. Senate and governor's candidates. Uh, how, why is there this change? What's fueling the fire? I think a lot of things are fueling the fire. One, people are finally waking up saying, this isn't working. We're getting the shaft. But the second thing is we have a lot of good candidates, so this is going to make it very difficult. But number three, Franken won 42 or 43 percent of the vote. That is not a mandate or even a majority. So when you have a candidate that viable and people are starting to look at their lack of work, lack of finding work, taxes going up, for all the stuff that the Democrats put out, it's not reality when you look at your paycheck or you no longer have a paycheck and something has to give. Franken's money and friends are in California and that is starting to permeate the populace. Does he care about Minnesotans? Doesn't seem to. It's no secret that the Republican Party of Minnesota had some financial issues stemming from 2010 and some things that went on. Uh, since Chairman Keith Downey has taken over, it seems like there's a renewed sense of confidence. Um, is the financial situation getting better for the party? Let me summarize the financial situation, Tony. We were over $2 million in debt at the end of 2012. Mm -hmm. And Pat Shortridge stepped in in a very difficult time because people were royally upset. And you can understand that. They gave this money and it's, nothing was there. So that was a very, very tough year. And we owe Pat Shortridge a debt of gratitude for putting up with that 15 months before Keith Downey was elected. But there were other players that were key in setting up the pay down on what we owe. Because if you are a political party, you cannot declare bankruptcy and just go home. You have to find a way to pay it off. And so we had a couple people 
really lay out a pay down plan. And the difficult year was the end of 2013 because there were a couple of balloon payments there. Those balloon payments were made. We are on a flat line play, payout schedule for the next few years. So it's stable. And that stability has brought back a lot of donors who were angry, justifiably, and saying, okay, we've stabilized, we're over the hump, and now it's too bad that we still have to keep paying that out. But it's better than what we walked into. And nobody in current office positions was here when that terrible situation arose. Mm -hmm. And Janet, you, being the National Committee woman, you have a, a lot of connections throughout the country. It, it maybe is an understatement to say that uh, the, the party here in Minnesota's reputation was a bit tarnished after some of this. Uh, are you uh, hearing from your colleagues uh, across the country? Uh, are people having more confidence in what we're doing here in Minnesota? They are having more confidence, but the other thing is, it, it's amazing. We've gone, we had three years where we replaced all committee women, the committee men, and the chairman. And right now, I'm the stable one. I've been there the longest, which is 15 months, <laughs> 18 months technically. And you have to work with people and you just let them know what you can do and when they're comfortable with you it kind of permeates the rest of the operation and they are and they want Al Franken gone so badly I mean they are so on board that he is an image that probably would be better if he went back in show business well Janet I certainly uh, appreciate your time and your insight and uh, we will continue to update you it's Friday afternoon about six o'clock here we're on the second ballot for the US Senate endorsement and thank you very much Janet thank you Tony 7:45 p.m. day one of the convention we still do not have an endorsement for the US Senate endorsement race they did announce the results from ballot number two so I'm going to share those with you right now uh, first of all Jim Abler he will no longer be in the race because uh, he only got 59 votes and he's below the 5% threshold. Uh, Chris Dahlberg actually went up. He went from 497 votes in the first to 647 in the second. That gives him 33% of the vote. Mike McFadden went from 458 votes to 497, uh, earning 25% of the delegation. Monty Moreno, uh, he will no longer uh, be in the race. He only uh, earned 13 votes in the second ballot, putting them at 0.6%. Uh, Senator Julianne Ortman went down from 447 to 401, uh, earning 20% of the vote in the second ballot. And Philip Parrish uh, actually increased his vote total from 323 to 331, going from 16% to 16.9%. A lot of people are talking about Philip Parrish uh, on the floor here. There's a lot of buzz about him. People didn't know much about him earlier, but he gave a riveting, heartfelt speech that touched a lot of people's hearts, and uh, people are talking about him now. So I'm with Chairman of the Republican Party, Keith Downey. Keith, uh, great to see you. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Glad to talk to you here. Seems like the convention is going uh, pretty smoothly so far, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, the mechanics of it, yeah. And we're obviously in the middle of a perhaps lengthy uh, multi ballot contest for U.S. Senate, but everything's going good and people are energized. It's fun. If you compare this, you know, I, I think back on the, the convention in 2012, and it, it's probably uh, an understatement to say that uh, the morale was down for Republicans, Republican right. activists. We we're facing a, a tough year, a tough financial situation. And I must say that. The uh, rumors and, and, and people talking here on the convention floor seems like people are very upbeat, very right. confident about this year to come. Uh, I've heard a lot of compliments uh, given to you as chairman and also Chairman Shortridge for taking over a situation that was pretty dire. Uh, can you talk uh, and tell the audience a little bit about what the leadership of the party has been doing to get the fiscal house in order? Well, first of all, I, I think uh, if I talk to the people directly, my, my first comment is to say thanks. All the people that stuck with the party and, and not just the donors, but the activists and all the leadership uh, and the local district organizations. Uh, this is totally a team effort. Um, I came in, I had a plan. 
uh, the kind of structural and financial piece of it um, seem to be pretty self-evident. Um, a lot of things that organizations and businesses deal with all the time. So fixing that, um, I don't want to say that was easy. It was a lot of tough work. Um, don't get me wrong. In some ways, coming together as a party around our core principles and the ideas that we hold dear and holding ourselves together as a group. Um, I think was even a bigger effort and again I applaud everyone else uh, after what was a really tough year in 2012 for hanging in there and sticking together and I think we're going to be stronger now. The other thing that, that I've noticed is looking around the delegation, the people who are attending this con convention, you're seeing a lot more diversity, uh, people from different cultures. Uh, we had Melissa Hackenmuller on earlier and Andrew Ojeda, I talked to him about it. Um, in your words, what is the party doing to uh, make the tent bigger, to invite more diverse communities and cultures to be part of uh, our party? Well, uh, it's somewhat tied to that first question where I said one of the bigger challenges was how do we hang together as, as a party in our, our coalition. And I think we realized, you know what, we have to grow. There's, there's no other way about it. And when you look at growing, um, I looked at the fundamentals and I thought, you know what, the Republican Party, our values, the things we stand for, I think are fundamentally consistent with the old traditional Minnesota ethic. And you go out and talk to people and whether they're in the urban core, uh, new Americans, the immigrant community who came here, for a job and a chance in the American dream, you know what, they are so aligned with the Republican Party. Um, so we've just made a much more intentional effort to get back out in front of the people, show them that we're on their side, tell them that we got ideas that are going to work for them, that we are actually the party of solutions, and you know a lot of good things are happening. So some of the U.S. Senate candidates and governor's candidates have said that they're going to uh, continue on no matter what happens in the endorsement. Um, how have you as chairman uh, how do you deal with that, it, you know, in terms of encouraging the endorsement process and then also uh, respecting the rights of people that continue to run in the primary? Um, do you think that it makes our party stronger or um, what's your feelings about that? Well, first of all, we will endorse and we will support our endorsed candidate with everything we got as a party. That's, that's why we exist and I think people get that and understand that. Um, I have always said that Republicans shouldn't fear a primary. That if our candidates are good and our party is strong and united, our endorsed candidates are going to do great in a primary. And as you said, if somebody feels it's, you know, it's a free country, if they feel that they're the right person uh, and they want to run in the primary, uh, we're not going to stop them. The real way to, I think, uh, uh, kind of defend the endorsement of the party is to continue to prevail in primary elections so that people realize that their only real chance of winning is to come through the party endorsement process. Not to politically manipulate people in the back room from doing it in the first place, but to just prove that, that we add value, we are strong, the best candidates are gonna come through our endorsement process, and then our endorsement will mean much more for the long haul. Okay, my last question, Chairman. Uh, I want your predictions in November. Uh, is Governor Dayton gonna get fired? Is Al Franken gonna get fired? And are Republicans going to regain the majority in the State House? You know, I think we got a real shot in all those, and I've said in my remarks that we have positioned ourselves to win. Uh, President Obama's 36% favorability in Minnesota, that's amazing after he was 54% in the last election. Uh, Al Franken is like 46% re-elect, Mark Dayton right around 50%. We've got a legitimate chance, and if they're top of ticket, is not strong to carry the rest of the legislative races as well. I think we got a real chance at all three. Chairman Downey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tony. Great. Have a good convention. Will do. So we just had the results of ballot number three read at the Republican Party of Minnesota U.S. Senate endorsement race. And uh, it ended with uh, Philip Parrish uh, conceding and endorsing Julianne Ortman. But here are the results from ballot three. Uh, Chris Dahlberg increased his ballot score from 647 to 799 with 41% of the vote. Mike McFadden got 557 votes for 28.8%. Julianne Ortman went down again, 350 votes with 18% of the delegation. And Philip Parrish uh, got 222 votes, totaling 11.4% of the delegate vote. And as I said, he conceded.
Take the hill, someone said. I like that. That's right. As a military man, we just put our head down and take the hill. Hey, I wanted to start out by saying to all the candidates who've been in this race tonight, uh, it's, it's been great to be up here to have the chance to you know, be before you making our case. So I think uh, first a hand, a round of applause to everybody in this, that all the candidates. But you know, it seems like it was ages ago, but you remember what I said when I came in here. I was the first candidate that said, I will abide by the endorsement. And I'm not no politician here. There's no gray area. I'm not going to waffle on this. So you make the decision tonight. But I honor that decision. And I respect you. You know, I'm, I'm 52 years old. I actually got involved in politics when I was 16 through the Republican Party. I was a delegate when I was 18, so I've been here before. I remember some of those famous ballots at 14 ballots. But we're going to do this tonight because you know what? Here's the history that works with the Republican Party. The only way that we've won in the past in a statewide race is when we get behind a candidate and endorse them. And that's why we need to do this today. We need, we, we can't send a Democrat light to Washington. I've said that. We have to have a strong constitutional conservative. Earlier I talked about being right on the issues, but I am the right candidate to take Al Franken. We talked about that map there, remember that? And we know what the problem is. We need to win northeastern Minnesota, and that's the catch. You know, you, you can, right. We cannot let one more time that much of the state go to the Democrats. You notice that uh, I'm, I'm standing up here all alone and I made that decision. But I'm not alone. I have all of you, right? That's what this endorsement process is about. You know, Senator Ortman, I honor her. She said that she honors the endorsement process. That's how we're going to win this. If I can, in my one minute left or two minutes, I want to just say a quick story. Here's how we win this. This is about boots on the ground. This is not about just throwing as much money as you can against the wall. Right, right on the issues, right candidate. But here's what happened in St. Louis County. And, and I have uh, one of the Grover couples here today, Tim and Linda Grover from Duluth. When I decided to run for, against a 32-year incumbent in St. Louis County, my friends Tim and Linda said, Chris, 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 <laughs> you're, you're a nice guy. But you cannot beat Bill Crone because he is the Jim Oberstar of the county board. It can't be done. Well, I took him on, and I had the DFL party against me. I had asked me the Government Employees Union against me, and I just put my head down and I charged that hill. But you know what? I wasn't alone charging that hill. I had the Duluth Republicans behind me working, and we had an organized ground game, and that's how we won that. <laughs> Chip Kravak knows a little bit because he followed me, and he took the actual Jim Oberstar out later. Kravak endorsed me, and I think he would know a little bit about an underdog. And looking at all the candidates in this race, he said, Chris Dahlberg is the only one that's going to take Al Franken on. He's the type of guy that can connect with Minnesotans and take this home for the Republican Party. I need you. Let's get this done. I need your endorsement. Thank you. Some people think it's getting late. I think it's early. I'm going to share something with you. When I decided to run for the U.S. Senate, it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. It was a huge leap of faith that my wife and I took and our family. It's 
because we believed we could do better. We had to do better. I looked at our nation and saw this career class of politician. I've talked about it a lot, but I believe in my heart it's killing us. I'd never fundraised before, never asked anybody for money. So I left my job. And I put my family at risk. And we do it with honor. So a year ago, when I was asked, will you abide by the endorsement? What I said was that I would work hard to get the endorsement. I would love to get the endorsement. But that I left my job, put my family at risk to beat Al Franken. And as long as I believe that I'm the best candidate to beat Al Franken, I'm going to stay in the race. And, 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 and I know, I know that will cause some of you not to vote for me. And I, and I respect that. But I always want you to know where I stand. And I've been candid on this from day one. You will always know where I stand. And my, my observation is that we can do better. To beat Al Franken, you need a candidate that can deliver a message of hope one of growth and prosperity. You have to have a, a, an organization statewide. We've been able to build that. And you got to be able to raise money. And I've worked my tail off with a lot of people to raise money. I didn't know if I'd be able to raise anything. Well, we've raised $3 million. <laughs> Al Franken has $5.5 million cash on hand. My next closest competitor that just graciously bowed out, and thank you, Julianne, for running. You made this race better for all of us. She had $230,000 cash on hand. And then after that, it's $44,000 cash on hand. If you want to beat Al Franken, we need to have the message, I'll deliver that. And we need to have the resources to do that. And I've proven that I can do it. It's not a trust me. It's not a hope. I will do it. And with all these people behind me, we will do it together. We can do better. We have two paths here. We can take a path to beat Al Franken. You vote for me, and we'll have $2 million at disposal to train on Al Franken on Monday. <laughs> Al Franken is wrong for our state. He's wrong for our country. His game plan is the federal government is the solution for everything, and he is wrong. He wants to control your health care. He wants to control your business. He wants to control your school. And that is wrong. Our belief here in Minnesota is that we control our destinies. I believe in you. That's why I'm running. It is with great honor that I ask for your support. I will work my tail off. I'd be so honored to have your endorsement. Thank you and God bless. So here we are at the Mayo Civic Center. It's almost midnight at the Republican Party of Minnesota endorsement for the U.S. Senate. Uh, breaking news is after the fifth ballot, State Senator Julianne Ortman uh, is no longer in the race. It is now a two-man race between Mike McFadden and St. Louis County Commissioner Chris Dahlberg. We heard from both the candidates for a five-minute speech and their attempt to sway any undecided voters. One interesting note is in the fifth ballot, 313 people left their ballots blank or voted for a no endorsement. So here we are at midnight. We're going to find out soon. Everybody wants to see a candidate endorse to run against Al Franken. 
uh, this coming fall. So stay tuned. It's exciting. We're going to see what's going to happen.